why don't we go ahead and get started? We have a couple logistical things to talk about uh, beforehand. So I'll turn my video back on. Uh, hey, everybody, I'm Justin Schell. I'm very excited to uh, be uh, co hosting this webinar um, featuring Kurt Menke from Bird's Eye View GIS. He's going to be talking uh, about using QGIS to map COVID data. Um, and the um, this is a, a follow-up from a workshop series that we did last year where Kurt came to Michigan and we did uh, workshops at four different places in Southeast Michigan at different campuses. Um, and so uh, he reached out to us again and see if he wanted to do something virtually and we said, yes, definitely. Um, and so this is the first uh, workshop and we'll have a link to another one that is next Friday um, as well, if you didn't already receive that. So, um, a few just sort of housekeeping details. Um, this is a webinar, not a, not a meeting. And so everyone is muted, both in audio and video, um, as they enter. Um, the, the chat is open as, as people are using it. Um, but we also have a Q&A function. And so if you have specific questions, we ask that you use the Q&A function. That allows for other people to upvote those and can give us a sense of priority um, what is most important. Um, There'll be a Q&A section at the end where Kurt can answer some questions. Um, so we'll take the questions from there. But it, in the meantime, uh, Tyler and I can try to answer some of these uh, with uh, within the chat section. Uh, Tyler, as you see, is our co-host. Um, he is an informationist at the Taubman Health Sciences Library uh, at the University of Michigan Library. Hello. And, um, and I'm Justin Schell. I've got to introduce myself. Uh, I run the Shapiro Design Lab at the University of Michigan Library. Um, we worked with Kurt to bring uh, him to Michigan uh, last year. Um, this is more of a demo, like sort of a demo than a workshop. And so we don't expect you to be able to follow along like you would perhaps in a workshop where in a computer lab or like the photo you see here. Um, but as we mentioned, this will be recorded and available um, by the end of the month. And so we'll send an email out to all the participants uh, with a link to that recording so you can go back and review uh, what you learned today. Um, and at, at the end of this, we will be sending out a survey uh, to everyone to get some more info about how you're using these tools. Are there additional training needs, interest in joining this sort of community of practice? Um, and so look for that in your email uh, coming soon after the completion of, of the webinar. And again, I know Tyler posted a link to this uh, into next week's webinar as well, and you can uh, register at that page. Um, I think that's all, all the logistics. Tyler or Kurt, am I, am I forgetting anything? Sounds good to you. Covered me. it. Okay. Uh, then I'm, I'm happy to introduce Kurt Menke from Bird's Eye View GIS. Uh, he's gonna go into a little bit more of his background shortly. So uh, take it away, Kurt. Great, thanks, Justin. Uh, the one thing I will mention, um, is that there is a little blog post about this Michigan training last year. If you're interested in that, the, that's what this link is here. It's on the communityhealthmaps.org website. So yeah, we're going to be um, mapping COVID data with QGIS today. I'm Kurt Menke with Bird's Eye View. And uh, Bird's Eye View is my main business, but I do have a few affiliations. I'm also associated with this thing called the Q Cooperative, which I'll introduce shortly. And I've been running the Community Health Maps program for the last 10 or 12 years. So I do a mix of spatial analysis, cartography, and teaching. Um, I'm a QGIS certified instructor, which simply means when I teach a workshop in QGIS, I can give an official QGIS certificate with that. I'm a charter member for the Open Source Geospatial Foundation, otherwise known as OSGEO. And I'm a voting member for the QGIS US user group. So there is a, a QGIS US user group and um, we can always use more participation in that. The URL to the group is right there. So if you are interested, you can visit the um, user group page. And as kind of a, a little sidebar, um, in case you weren't aware, last month that group held a, a virtual QGIS North America 2020 conference that ran three consecutive Fridays. And all the talks and workshops were recorded and are available on YouTube at this URL here. You can just simply go to YouTube and search for QGIS NA 2020 and find it pretty easily. And so I just want to let people know that there's a whole series of QGIS related talks and workshops up there available from last month. 
um, just to continue to introduce myself. I'm also a QGIS author. Uh, my most recent book I did with um, a Dutch hydrologist colleague of mine, Hans van der Quast, and it's QGIS for hydrological applications. And before that, I published Discover QGIS 3X, which is a large 400 page workbook with a pretty thorough treatment of QGIS. These are both um, published with Locate Press and uh, you can find more information about them at this link. I'm also part of the Q Cooperative, which I mentioned, which is an organization that has several QGIS core developers as part of it. And so we offer QGIS support services. So for example, if you needed a custom QGIS plugin or were interested in a new feature for QGIS or QGIS server or some training, um, we can help out with that. So I wanna um, start out now with that the introductions are out of the way, um, just introducing the Community Health Maps program um, for those of you who aren't aware of it. This is a project of the National Library of Medicine and uh, NLM, if you aren't aware, is part of the National Institutes of Health. It's the biggest biomedical research laboratory in the US. And this program was developed in NLM's Division of Specialized Information Services which also contains an outreach and special populations branch. And so the mission of, and I, and I have highlighted the word was because um, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. The, the mission of SIS and the outreach and special populations branch is to seek to improve access to quality and accurate health information, especially for underserved and minority populations. But there are big changes coming to community health maps. Over the last year, the National Library of Medicine has been completely reorganized and the Division of Specialized Information Services no longer exists. So this means that the Community Health Maps program no longer fits into any program area at NLM. So NLM is ceasing support of this program starting next month. My, my contract ends on September 20th. Um, and so, the Community Health Maps program is basically being transferred to community funded support. As part of this, um, I've migrated the website, which used to reside at the .nlm.nih.gov domain to a .org domain. So the whole site has been migrated to this new URL. So make sure to bookmark the new um, website for Community Health Maps. And importantly, this change means that community health maps is very soon to become an unfunded project. This is the last official, this, this webinar series is the last official uh, funded, NLM funded community health maps uh, trainings. So on September 21st of next month, community health maps will become an unfunded project. So I just wanna put this out there because I really don't wanna see this program die. If, if you know of funding opportunities or grants, or if you even know of organizations who would like some training, uh, please get in touch with me. So with that out of the way, the, the goal of this program is to empower community organizations and specifically organizations who focus on vulnerable populations, who frequently use and collect data and need some mapping tools, but don't have the resources for either training or proprietary software licenses um, and are looking for kind of intuitive, freely available solutions. So the way this program has worked is that um, we'll go and give presentations and conduct workshops. Over the last 10 years, we've probably given well over 50 workshops in dozens of US states. Um, we use the train the trainer method where we invite people who are leaders in their community to participate in the training and then they can take the training back to their community and, and pass that on to, to people in their community. Um, since we're usually only face to face with people for, you know, half a day or a day, there's a good list of resources that we make available on the website. There's a blog, there's lab exercises that you can download and go through in a self-paced way. And I'm available for consultations on different organizations projects. And um, so really, we're really there to empower organizations. Um, the, the program has never had any interest in data ownership or, or steering how people use these tools. 
we're simply there to teach you how to use them, how to analyze and manage your own data and kind of turn you loose to, to do what you need to do. So as part of these workshops, we offer um, kind of a complete suite of, of training, starting out with field data collection. And so the topic of next Friday's webinar will be a really nice, new, exciting, free uh, data collection method tied to QGIS. Um, this is a picture of a training I did in American Samoa last fall. So we usually try to have some fun when we're out collecting data as well. Um, we also teach how to do desktop GIS analysis and cartography, and finally web mapping. And not all projects will need all, all three of these components, but collectively this workflow, as we call it, basically allows you to um, undertake any community-based GIS mapping project that you need to do. So today we're gonna to be focusing on QGIS, which is the leading free and open source desktop GIS. It runs on all the operating systems, Mac, Windows, Linux. It's uh, generally pretty intuitive. It reads and writes all the, really a silly number of GIS formats. So every, every one that you're gonna ever need to pull in and work with, it will, it will um, consume. It has really powerful analysis tools and some really amazing cartographic tools, some of which we'll see today. Normally I go through a pretty good suite of case studies, um, but since today we're trying to squeeze a lot into this hour, um, I'm really gonna focus on the Miami, Florida king tides, but these are all examples of projects that we've done throughout the US and all of these are covered as, um, and tagged as case studies on the Community Health Maps blog. So um, you could go to the blog and search for case studies and find nice write-ups of all of these different projects. I'll probably cover some of these um, next week um, as that some of these that focus more on field data collection. So um, to talk briefly just about one example of how community health maps has been used, I'm gonna talk about this project we did in 2017 in Miami documenting king tides. So, this is definitely the most disaster specific and social justice kind of project that we've been involved with. And um, if you're not familiar with King Tides, it's a term that refers to the highest tides of the year. So in Florida, they, they happen usually in the fall. And um, while I'm describing this, these people are standing on a street in their neighborhood at high tide. So it's a pretty severe situation in Miami right now. They're basically experiencing sea level rise associated with climate change. And um, the city sits on a limestone bed. And so water just moves up through that porous geology in, into people's neighborhoods and tends to affect people in, in the poorer neighborhoods uh, disproportionately. So when we got involved in this project, there was already a team of local groups working on it, but they hadn't um, incorporated mapping into it. So the New Florida Majority, Florida International University, and the Unitarian Universalist Church down there had already developed a really nice data collection protocol where they would use these test kits in this picture to measure the depth of the floodwaters, to take water samples to test for bacterial contamination like fecal coliform, and also measure the salinity of the water since this is a salt water coming in. Um, and there's a nice blog post that's linked here on this um, project, but to, it's a, a, a beautiful case study on how intuitive some of these open source mapping tools are becoming, where these people are just community members that we met in, that live in this neighborhood who have never heard of GIS, have never made a map, never collected data before, and we're able to, in four hours to train them how to use their own phones to go out and collect this data along with this specific test kit. And to give you an idea of what, how this looks, this is a low income housing unit in this neighborhood in Shorecrest that we were working in. And this is at low tide. And um, to compound matters, we had, um, this was six days after Hurricane Irma had hit Miami. So the city was already recovering from the hurricane and you'll see in some of these shots, you know, debris piled up in different places because they're still cleaning up from the hurricane. But this um, sewer grate right here becomes um, an issue at high tide. So if I show you this, this is that same 
um, low income housing unit an hour and a half later at high tide. And this is another shot. This is just down the street at a road intersection. And this is at low tide. And you can see even at low tide, um, not all the water recedes. And at high tide, it becomes a little lake. And the problem is that we, we tested this water and over 95% of the samples came back positive for fecal coliform. And people's kids are walking through this on their way to the, get to the bus stop. Um, people are driving through it multiple times a day. They're, they're cars are rusting, it's killing their lawns. It's, it's you know, parks where kids play are being flooded with this. So it's, it's a real uh, public health hazard. And it's, a, and it's an ongoing issue that there's, um, you know, the solutions are gonna be difficult. So we were able to um, get a bunch of data collected by this crowdsourcing effort and using all these free tools. And this is a, an elevation surface for the, the Shorecrest neighborhood that we were working in. And these points are where we were collecting data the first day. And I've uh, symbolized them based on the depth of the water, anywhere from you know, 14 to two or three inches. So deeper in some spots than others. And this elevation surface is interesting because this is a, a mixed use neighborhood and the, the lower, the green areas are lower elevation. So that um, low income housing unit is right here, a couple feet lower than some of the other properties. So people that have a little more money have actually, some of them have built houses on raised pads so that they are protected from floodwaters a little bit more, but the people with less money aren't able to do that. Um, so that's some of what's being depicted here. And um, these are just maps that I was able to pull together with the group um, in our hotel room after the data collection that day. And um, for this, we use Fulcrum. Next week, I'll be showing you how to use something called input that's tied to QGIS, which is completely free. And uh, this is showing the same data collection points, but um, shown by the salinity. So you can see the salinity varied quite a bit. There were some areas with very high salinity and, and some with lower salinity. And this is an air photo of that. So the this is that low income housing unit here. And the, the intersection I showed is this intersection right here. So it's a very interesting applied project. And I'll go through some more case studies next week, but I wanna spend the bulk of this hour actually mapping COVID and talking about data sources. So um, again, I don't expect you to be able to follow along with all the steps that I will do. This is gonna be a, a live demo in QGIS, um, but uh, you can refer back to the, the video when it's posted and the slides. So I'm going to start covering different data sources and then we'll actually go out and download data, bring it into QGIS and start working with it to create a map like this. So one issue that um, you'll find as you are trying to do this is that you basically need two data sets. You need some kind of polygon data set like counties or states or country boundaries. And then you need the COVID data to join to that. So here, this is a table, an attribute table for a county's layer. So you can see the, the state name, the county name. And then in the US, we have these things called FIPS codes. So there's a two digit code for the state and a three digit code for the county. And you combine those and you get this five digit code, which is a unique identifier for that county within the US. And so we have this over here, a table that has COVID cases on August 11th for each county. So you can see we have the same code in both of these tables and we can use that to do a join which appends this August 11th data to our county's um, GIS layer. So that's what we're looking for with data. So in terms of uh, geographic data for US um, boundaries, we have uh, the US census which pr produces these cartographic boundary files. And these are all the boundaries that the US Census works with, starting at states, um, counties, down to tracks, block groups, and blocks, all the different geographies that the census uses to conduct the, the US Census every 10 years. Um, we're going to be working with this USA counties with population data published on an ESRI portal because it already has some population and socioeconomic variables attached to it. If you download a county layer from the cartographic boundary files, it'll just have the county name and the FIPS code, but no, geo no uh, population data attached to it. And it's, you can download that from the census, but in the interest of time, we're gonna use a data set that already has that attached. If you're working on other uh, places outside the US, the World Bank has a nice data set of official country boundaries. 
and this uh, natural earth is another great resource. It has um, all kinds of data, not just um, country and state boundaries for the world, but it also contains roads and places and all, all sorts of um, background data that you'd want to use to make maps. So those would be really good data sources outside the US. In terms of COVID-19 data, uh, the New York Times publishes on their GitHub repo um, a data set that's updated daily. And Johns Hopkins University, uh, their CCSE, um, publishes on GitHub another data set. And both, we're going to see examples of using both of these today, but they're structured differently, which is one thing that I want to point out. So if we look at this New York Times data, here we have, we're looking at Wayne County in Michigan. So we see Wayne County, Michigan and its FIPS code and the number of cases and deaths. And there's a, a record for each date. So there's basically a separate copy of Wayne County for every date that the pandemic has been going on. And it includes both cases and deaths in the same file. Whereas the Johns Hopkins data is, you know, flipped 90 degrees. It has um, one record for Wayne County, but it has extra columns added for each date. So we're gonna, this is the one we're gonna work with mostly in our demonstration today, but I'm gonna show you another example of how this data structure might be useful as well. So the Johns Hopkins data, this is um, number of confirmed cases for each date. So you see them going up through time. They also have a separate data set that is um, number of deaths per date related to COVID. So um, with that, I'm gonna spend the rest of the hour doing most, a live demo. So I'm gonna start by downloading some of this data, unzipping it, or we'll add it to QGIS. We're gonna to have, to, have to do a little data massaging and then we'll do a join between the COVID data and the counties. And then we'll see how we can style this data. And one thing I'll point out here is that this isn't just a map of raw COVID cases. It's a rate of cases per 1 million people. So we're going to, that's why we wanted the, the county's data with population. Because if we just map raw COVID cases, you really end up making a population map or, or the population centers really pop out. Whereas if we do it as a rate against population, we really start seeing the hotspots for COVID, not just population. So I'm going to get out of my presentation here and I'm gonna bring up an empty QGIS project. This is what QGIS looks like um, before we've added anything to it. So let's download some data. Here I am in my web browser and this is the ArcGIS hub page that has this nice US counties data set. And I'm just gonna download this data as a shape file. And I'm gonna save it into this webinar folder. And while this is downloading, it shows us all the attribute columns that come with this. So notably we have a population column and a bunch of other socioeconomic breakdowns of population, which are interesting. So I'm going to um, open the folder that this was downloaded to, and it's a zip file. So the first thing I'm gonna do is unzip this. And then I'm gonna bring up QGIS and it's uh, pretty easy to add data. I'm just gonna drag and drop the shape file part of this layer into QGIS. And this counties layer covers all 50 states and even uh, territories like Puerto Rico. And for today's demo, I'm just gonna focus on the lower 48. So one thing I'm gonna do here is zoom in a little bit and I'm gonna remove everything that's not part of the lower 48. So I'm gonna use this select tool to select the lower 48 counties. And I get highlighted in yellow. And then this button here will invert the selection. There's a couple of different selection tools. So I'm gonna invert the selection so that everything outside the lower 48 is now selected. I'm gonna click this little pencil icon to put this layer into edit mode. And then I'm gonna delete these selected records. And I'll stop editing and save my edits. So now I just have a counties layer for the lower 48. And I can right click and zoom to it so we can see it a little better. And this is what the US looks like in what we call decimal degrees or latitude longitude. 
an unprojected coordinate system. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is down here in the lower right hand corner, it shows the coordinate system of my map. So I'm gonna click on this and change the coordinate system that my map is in. And I'm not gonna to delve too long on projections, but we're gonna use a projection that is known as an equal area projection. Since we're gonna be mapping basically uh, density of cases across the US, we want a projection, well, to back up a little bit, projections can maintain and distort different properties like distance and angles and areas. And so we want a projection that maintains equal areas since we're mapping data across areas. So I'm gonna choose this and click OK. And it will also put the US into a shape that we're more used to seeing it in. Okay, so now I'm gonna um, go back to the web browser and I'm gonna download the COVID data. So this is the um, GitHub repository for Johns Hopkins. And they have um, a, a, a nice suite of data here and they have nice descriptions below that you can read and they even have lists of other data sources by state and country. But we're gonna focus on their COVID-19 data. So I'll click that link. And this brings me to this page where I have daily reports, daily reports for just the US and time series data. And I'm gonna focus on the time series data here. And here are these CSVs, comma separated value files. So they have one for confirmed cases for the US, deaths for the US, um, and then they have some global data sets for confirmed cases, deaths, and, and people recovered from COVID. So we're gonna map the confirmed cases. So I'm gonna double click on this layer, and then I'm just gonna right click on the download link and save this into the webinar folder. So if I bring up my Windows Explorer, um, here's that text file that I just downloaded. It is actually a CSV and it, it gets saved as a, a .text. So I'm gonna rename this as a .csv so that when I bring it into QGIS, QGIS will interpret it correctly. So I'm just gonna drag this CSV into QGIS as well. And when I do that, it shows up as just a table because it doesn't have any geography yet. So um, let's look at some of the, the attributes we have to work with. So if I open up the attribute table for the USA counties, I can see we have the county name, state name, and we have this FIPS code here. So the FIPS code is that five digit and in, in QGIS when you open up something and you see that it's left justified, that means it's stored as text. If it's right justified, like the population, it's being stored as numbers. So we can see that this FIPS code is um, stored as text and it's five digits. Now I'm gonna open up the data that we wanna join to it to see what that looks like. So here we have, um, again, we have the, the province and the, and the county name. There's latitude, longitude here, which we could actually use to map data based on the centroids. Whoops, bring that back up. Centroids of each county. Um, and we may have time to look at that. Um, and then we see all these dates off to the right that are gonna have total cases starting on January 22nd, all the way up to the current day or yesterday, I believe. Um, and we have the FIPS code here. And you can see that it, it looks pretty good, but it has this um, decimal point followed by a zero. And so we're gonna need to um, remove that so the data joins to our counties. So we have a little bit of massaging to do to this data set. And in QGIS, we can't edit a CSV directly. So I'm going to export this out to another format called a geo package, which is um, a little spatial database and it's the default format for QGIS. So I'm gonna call my geo package COVID and this table I'll call um, cases. Click okay. So now I can um, remove this original version of this data because I have an, a new copy of it. And if I open this, I can edit it to fix this data with the, this FIPS data issue. So I'm gonna put this um, into edit mode. It's a really large table with lots of columns. So it's, uh, 
causing a little lag here. So here, I'm gonna put it into edit mode. And when I do that, a couple buttons become active. I'm gonna use this one to add a new column. And I'm just gonna call this joiner. It's gonna be what I'm gonna to use to join to the counties. And I'm gonna make this a text column, which is five digits long, because that's how long our FIPS codes are. So I'll go ahead and uh, click OK. And I'll use a little trick here. Um, if I right click on one of my columns, there's an organize columns option. And I can use this to move that joiner column up so that it's right next to my FIPS so that I can see them both side by side as I'm working on them. So here's my new column that I need to populate. And I'm going to select that as the column to, to uh, put values into. And then I'm going to let me move this out of the way. I'm going to use this drop down to just choose FIPS. So I'm basically telling QGIS I'm going to populate this new joiner field with the data that's in the FIPS column. I'll choose Update All, and you can see that gets put in there. And it's taking care of most of those issues. Since we only have room for five digits, it's stripped off the decimal point and the zero automatically. But if I sort this by um, state, you can see that um, FIPS codes are basically alphabetical. So the, the first state, like Alabama, its code, its state code should be zero, 01. And here it's just a single one, the leading zero is missing. So I'm, I just need to re-add that leading zero in for um, these states that have that leading zero in them. I, I think it goes up to about Connecticut. So I'm simply going to select these um, records that need to have that leading zero added to it so that it will match with our county's data. And this time, instead of just pointing it at a field, I'm going to click the expression button. And I'm going to um, basically tell it to append a zero in front of that. So I'm going to hit a single tick, zero, single tick, telling it that I'm going to add this piece of text. I'm going to hit this concatenation operator, which allows me to glue two pieces of text together. And then I'm going to go find my joiner field. And you can see the output preview down here now shows 01001, which is what I want. So I'll click OK. And I'm just going to update the selected records now. The others are fine. So you can see now these have been modified to be the correct format. And I can go ahead and save this. And I know from experience, this is such a huge table, it's gonna take a minute or so for this to save. So this might be a good little opportunity if there's any questions so far that people have to address a, a quick question. There's nothing in the Q and A or the chat, but if people have a question and they wanna put it in the Q and A section, you can answer it. So yeah, this is, um, so we have, you know, I can, and how many, how many days of the year have we had? Basically we've had, you know, 250 days of the year. So there's a lot of columns in this table and it's just so big that it takes a little bit to save when you've made a, um, ed edit to it. And you'll see this, um, data is interesting. There are some things that aren't counties in here like unassigned or out of Connecticut. Um, there are ships and things like that in here. So there's things that are not gonna join to our counties, but we've got most of them. You can see the Diamond Princess right there, um, which is a, a liner. Okay, so it's saved. I'm gonna go ahead and close this. And now we can um, build our join. So, so, to Kurt, do the, so Kurt, before yeah. we just got a quick question. What is the advantage of using geo package over shape file? Um, well, this is just a table. So a shape file is for actual spatial features. Um, a geo package can um, store both tables and GIS layers. So we, this is still just a table. So we couldn't save it as a shape file because it doesn't have any geometries. We could save it as a DBF, which is how shape files store um, tabular information, but that has some severe limitations like not being able to store um, 
column names longer than um, 10 digits. And it also has a limit on the number of fields it can hold. So um, GeoPackage um, basically doesn't have some of the limitations in data structure that a shapefile has. Great, thanks. So I'm going to um, right click on my counties layer and go to the properties of this layer. And I'm going to choose the joins tab and I'm going to click the green plus to add a join. So I'm going to be joining to my counties, my COVID cases table. I'm going to be using the joiner field. And then I'm going to point it to the FIPS field in my county shape file. So I've got the two fields the join is going to be based on. We also have all these columns in this um, COVID cases table. And we really, for today's purposes, only need the most recent date. We don't need all of them. So I'm just going to choose, um, activate this join fields and select just the most current date in here. And I don't want any prefix for this column. So I'm going to backspace through that. So we'll, with this join, we'll just have this one column joined to our shape file. So click OK and click OK. And now if I open up the attribute table for my counties and scroll to the right, I should see that new column. So here's our um, 8-13-20 COVID cases attached to the end of our counties. So at this point, we should be in, begin to uh, style our data and make a map. So when we bring a layer like counties into QGIS, it gives it a random styling. So right here, it's, it's this kind of beige brown color. And I'm gonna, it's also a single symbol. Every county has the same symbol. So I'm gonna change this to a graduated renderer, which lets me basically style it based on a numeric column. And if I um, click on value, it'll show me all the numeric columns like population in my data set. And if I scroll to the bottom, I don't see that column. So let's troubleshoot this. If I open up my layer properties and go to fields, I see that this little field with the join icon next to it that I appended is a string field. It's not stored as numbers, it's stored as text. But I can fix that really quickly here. I can basically put my table into edit mode here, add a new column, and I'll call it August 13, and I'll make it a whole number field and click OK. And I can calculate it here too. I can click this little field calculator and tell QGIS to update an existing field, this one August 13th that I just created with a little one, two, three indicating it's a numeric field. And I can calculate that to the one I joined. So QGIS always gives you a hint as to the format. This one, this one I joined has an ABC indicating it's text. So I'm gonna calculate this new numeric field to have the same data that the original text one had. And QGIS will take care of the formatting on the way in. And um, so I can stop editing. And I can actually get rid of the join now. I no longer need it because I now have that data added as a, a native field in my layer. So I can click the minus button to remove this join. And when I revisit my layer styling panel here and go back to value, I see my column here. So there's my August 13th COVID data. And now I just need to click classify. And so now I see a map of COVID cases in the US by county. And I can uh, do some things um, that there's I can increase the number of classes. I can change the color ramp. Let me pull this out a little bit to like a red, yellow, blue. And um, when we're making, this is called a chloropleth map where we're mapping data across a bunch of polygons. And the little black outlines can be a little distracting. And so I can get rid of all those and replace them with a white outline. And instead of going into each individual class and changing that, I can go into the symbol here, select simple fill, and tell it to have a stroke color of white instead of black. 
and give it a thinner stroke width. So now I have my um, cases and um, we're, right now we're looking at total cases. So again, I mentioned doing this by um, as a rate. So up here where I have value of August 13th, there's an expression button as well. So I can go in here and instead of just mapping the data by case, I can normalize it by population. So the way that would work is I can put my cursor after this August 13th field and hit a division symbol, expand this, which shows me all my fields in my attribute table and double click on population to add that. So now I'm dividing cases by population. And if I go ahead and wrap this whole expression in parentheses, I can multiply that times 1 million to make this a rate of cases per 1 million people. So I'll click OK and classify this again, and we'll see the map change. Now, one thing we have here is that the highest numbers are being shown in blue and the lowest numbers are being shown in red, which is kind of counterintuitive. So I'm going to right click on my color ramp and tell Qtis to invert their color ramp. So that looks a little more like it. Now we're showing the rate of COVID cases per 1 million people in a nice intuitive color ramp. So the next thing I want to add to the map is state boundaries. So I'm going to go up to my web browser and go to this link I provided for cartographic boundary files from the US Census, and I'm going to download their states layer. Save it into my folder. It's a pretty small download. So now I'm going to unzip that. And I'm simply going to drag the state's shapefile onto my map. And with this, um, I don't want it covering my map, obviously. So I'm going to choose simple fill and give it a fill style of no brush. And then just bump up the width of the state boundaries a little bit so that we get a little context of what we're looking at. So at this point, I'm ready to make my print composition. So I'm going to click this button up here to open a new print layout. And it's going to open up as a separate window. And it defaults to this um, landscape A4 sheet. And if I want to change that to a letter size sheet or another orientation, I would right click on it, choose page properties. And from the page size, choose letter. And I'm going to zoom to the whole sheet so we can see it a little better. And along the left-hand side here, we have all these tools for adding different map elements, like a legend or a scale bar or a north arrow. And the most important map element is the map itself. So I'm going to click this Add Map button and drag a box where I want the map to go on this piece of paper. So there's our map. Next, I'm going to add a title to it. And I have it on my clipboard. So I'm going to replace this um, placeholder text with the title that I want. And then I'm just going to change the font. So I'm going to search for Times New Roman. Oops. And I'm going to make it a, a bigger font, bold. And then use these controls to center it within that text box. And the last thing I'm going to add is a legend. We're going to use the legend tool to drag a box where I want the legend to go, where I have some space. And with the legend, I only really want to have the, the counties on here. So I'm going to uncheck this auto update option, select the COVID cases table and remove it from my legend. Select the states and remove that. And then here I can go in and rename my counties layer from the name of the shape file to something that's more intuitive to the map reader, like COVID cases per 1 million people on August 13th, 2020. 
You can also go in here and do things like um, make this instead of a zero to 27,000, you can do a less than. And for the upper case, upper class, I can um, do this greater than 215,000. And so then I have, there I have my um, legend. I can take the background off so it fits a little better. And I have my map. So the last thing I'm going to do here is export it. Export as an image or export as a PDF. I'll choose image here and I'll save it into my webinars folder with the default settings. And as soon as that's exported, you get this link to the export location on your computer. So I can click that and it highlights my exported map. And there it is. So that's a, um, a quick demo of how to download and bring data into QGIS to make um, an animation. Um, I'm gonna go back into my PowerPoint now. And I wanna show you this. Um, this is another um, way to show COVID data. And this is using the New York Times David data, not the Johns Hopkins. This is a temporal animation that starts at the beginning of the outbreak and basically shows one frame per day all the way up to the current situation. And um, this is using a new feature in the very latest version of QGIS 314 Pi and it's called the temporal controller. And so to quickly show you this, I have that map project open here. So here's that map project and I have this temporal controller panel here. And you remember I explained the, the structure of the New York Times data versus the Johns Hopkins data. And so I did a special kind of join here where instead of just appending fields to it, I did a one to many join. So it basically with the New York Times data creates a separate copy of the counties for every day of the outbreak. And so we end up with a very large data set. It's over 400,000 records um, and it's several gigs in size. So it's a little unwieldy and takes time to work with. But then I can also um, show that um, these little, see when I hover over this layer, it has this little clock icon next to it, indicating that it's a temporal layer. And if I double click on that, it opens up layer properties to the temporal tab. And it's showing me that I've set this um, layer to be time aware based on this date column. And so I can open up this temporal controller panel down here and then step through time basically. So here I'm looking at April 26. I could slide the time slider ahead to a later date where the outbreak is more intense. And again, this is a big data set, so it takes time to render, um, but you can start sliding through time with that. And there's another button down here that allows you to export the animation as still images. And um, you can then generate a GIF like this from those still images. Um, I'm also using some things in here. So this isn't a print composition, but you're seeing the legend show up. Q just has these things called decorations. So if I go to the view menu to decorations, there's these different things you can add to the main map canvas, like a title, an image, which is how I set the legend in there. I basically created the uh, legend in a print composer and exported it as a little image to put on the map. Um, so there's different tricks in here that you can use to basically annotate your map canvas with things so that the final animation includes all of that. And because I know I, I didn't have time to really cover all the nitty gritty details of how this is done, what I did for this webinar was create a, a blog post on the Community Health Maps webpage that walks through step-by-step -step how to create one of these temporal animations from that New York Times data, all the way through using the open source GIMP software to stitch all those still images together into an animation. So to kind of wrap up here, the blog is another resource that Community Health Maps has for you. So this is where I can cover these kind of new mapping technologies. Um, so I can keep community health mappers abreast of all the, the latest technologies. I mentioned the lab exercises. This is the link to those on the 
community health maps page. So there's a, a list of six self-paced labs that you can run through. I'll be updating the field data collection one in the next couple of weeks to represent what I'll cover next Friday in that webinar. There's also an online tutorial with community health maps. And this is basically in video form what we typically cover in a face-to-face -face community health maps um, workshop. And the value of this is that um, you, this provides continuing education credits through the Medical Library Association. So people needing CEs can use this um, to get some CEs as well. And finally, I just wanted to thank, this was a team effort. I wanna thank the, the webinar team from the University of Michigan Libraries, Tyler Nix, Justin Schell, Marissa Conti, and Alexandra Rivera who helped put all this together. And um, I think we have just enough time to hopefully answer some of the questions that have come up um, during the uh, webinar. So if you have any questions or if there's other things you want to see, we have about um, eight minutes left, I believe, to address any questions. So if, uh, if you want to ask a question, we can promote you uh, to your presenter. And so if you can just use either, um, either type in the chat or just use the raise hand feature. Uh, within the participant list next to your name, uh, we can we can uh, turn your mic on to ask the question, or you can put it in the chat. Thank you for the kind words, everybody. Um, if we, and if if while we're waiting for questions to uh, appear, or if there aren't any, um, what I can do is bring up this. Um, whoops, wrong one this uh, temporal animation project and show you a little bit more about that. Um, so I covered a little bit about the, the counties and how that's, that's set up um, as a temporal layer. And, and in QGIS 314, you'll have this little button up here, the temporal controller panel, and that's what opens this, this panel down below. And this panel basically has these time controls that let you step through time you can set it for different intervals. I have it set to one day here, but you can set this to any slice of time that you need. Um, and another trick that is done here is the, the time date here. So this um, layer that shows June 28th, 2020 is actually a point layer. And if I go to the symbology for it, it's using this renderer of no symbols. I don't wanna see the point, I just want to have the label there. So I'm using no symbols. And for the labeling expression, I'm using this variable map start time, which is a variable that um, came with the temporal controller. And it represents the current time period of the current frame of the map. So that this will update automatically as I go through time. And I'm then just wrapping this in this format date function so that I get the date formatted the way I want it to be. So Kurt, uh, there was a question from Kate, uh, sort of a meta question. She says, uh, can you comment on how you approach training online versus training face-to-face? -face? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, in my experience, both the instructor and the student's attention span is shorter online. So one thing I've noticed is um, limiting trainings to two hours tops and taking a, you know, a, a five or 10 minute break each hour to, to give people a break. Um, and then, you know, the technologies like Zoom are constantly evolving, but having some way to monitor people's progress is also tricky. Um, so there are some technologies in Zoom, for example, like reactions that let people raise their hand or polls where you can ask people if they're done yet um, so that you can pace the content appropriately. Um, but but uh, those are my main take homes. And I should point out that in the QGIS North America conference that was held last month, there was a, what's called a birds of a feather session on people talking about different strategies for online teaching. So um, you might wanna check that out because it was a really interesting discussion. 
Another question that's came up uh, from Jonathan. What is the platform for more suitable for web maps, Carto or Mapbox? Uh, I think both those are great for, for web mapping. Um, from what I've seen, Carto's licensing has gotten pretty high. So I think that's a, a showstopper for a lot of people, whereas Mapbox has a free version. Um, so I think Cardo is more intuitive, but seems to be more expensive right now. Mapbox is, um, takes a little bit more, a um, little bit steeper learning curve, but there's a free version of it. Um, I should also mention there's a QGIS plugin called QGIS to web, which will export a QGIS map um, out to a, a local set of JavaScript files that um, you could put on a server too. So there's some nice options within QGIS. Okay, another question from Kirsten. Uh, what kinds of questions and issues did groups come to you with in your CHM consultations? Was it typically people who had come to workshops previously? Yeah, so usually, um, you know, we would go to groups who requested a workshop. And so they usually had some kind of mapping project in mind already that they wanted to undertake and needed some support to do that. So typically their questions came with, um, you know, we, we, you know, you, can, you can't really cover QGIS in, in half a day or a day. There's a lot to it. So their questions were usually centered around um, data specific issues, how to work with data, um, how to set the data up, how to maintain it, um, how to share data, um, or how to do specific analysis steps. So some of the more um, complicated issues were usually what people would follow up with. I uh, just want to mention that Alex uh, brought up that, uh, you know, Q, Q just uh, web is great and also using leaflet with GitHub is another option. Absolutely. Yep. Good suggestion. Uh, another question. Uh, one thing about the legend or actually the values you use while making your graduated map, this really has some manipulative options. Do the health professionals see certain numbers of cases population as real thresholds? That's a good question. So, um, my caveat is that I'm a, a GIS geo person, not a health, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not trained in, in public health. So um, I'm not really sure. I can't, I don't really feel um, qualified to answer that question, honestly. It depends on how you define manipulative in that question. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, there, there are ethics in mapping for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, with, with COVID, the, the main mistakes I've seen people make is either um, just, um, you know, with, with a chloropleth map like this, you can, um, set things up in a lot of ways. And sometimes people will have, um, like, for example, if I use, you know, on my other map, um, a monochromatic color ramp, like from just a single color, like blues, and I get up to a point above seven or eight classes, it gets to the point where the human eye can't distinguish individual colors from one another anymore um, or people are just showing COVID cases not normalized against population and it really just turns into a population map not a COVID map because there's going to be far more people with COVID in Los Angeles than there are on the Navajo reservation but the rate is going to be higher right now on the Navajo reservation so I think it's more informative to <clears throat> kind of do that kind of Think, think about how you're displaying the data than um, doing something easy. Um, Alex mentions it gets to the MAUP, the modifiable aerial unit problem. Ah, yeah. Be careful about zip codes and thinking critically about boundaries. Uh, we have time for one last question. Um, is there a way in QGIS to turn wide format data information into long format data that can be fed in the temporal controller? Oh, yes. Um, that's the kind of thing that I would usually, um, there's a, a spatial database called PostGIS. Well, it's actually um, PostgreSQL and there's an extension called PostGIS. And um, that kind of data manipulation would be really um, easier in PostGIS or, or uh, even, even R, I think, um, than doing it straight in QGIS. Okay, well, with that, we are out of time. Um, again, uh, another workshop, uh, same, same time, same uh, different day next, next Friday. 
uh, two o'clock Eastern Standard Time, or is it Eastern Time right now? I never can remember that difference um, when that change happens. But uh, you know, our and actually, could you put up the email address uh, slide again? Just the, the first slide, uh, just people have that. Um, and again, we will share out the recording and the slides um, after this. Uh, but if you have any questions, uh, you know, about the overall series or anything like that, you can email us at chmworkshops at umich edu. Uh, thanks everybody for attending and uh, we will see some of you next week.